Virginia Blythe, Senior Awards Editor at Deadline, and I'm your host for today's Half Hour with Saltburn. Joining me is Emerald Fennell, the writer, director, and producer of Saltburn. Emerald, of course, won an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for her first feature, Promising Young Woman, which was also nominated for Best Picture. And she became the first British woman to be nominated for Best Director. Welcome, Emerald. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Could you give us a quick overview of what audiences can expect from Saltburn? (laughs) You know, I have never, in all the time of talking about this film, I have never become better at pithily describing it. It's a movie about falling in love for the first time and what that does to you. And it's a dark, dark comedy that will make you hopefully feel freaked out and turned on. (laughs) So before we get into discussing the film more, I'm going to have us look at a trailer. Did you know there was a college Christmas party tonight? As if we actually want to talk to those losers. (laughs) You all right? Yeah, I've got a flat tire. Take my bike. Hey, that is so kind. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't know your name. I'm uh, I'm Felix. Oliver. Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, I love you. I love yeah. I love you. All right, cheers, Ollie. My parents, they've got problems. What kind of? What do you mean, problems? I don't think I'll ever go home again. Well, why don't you come home with me? Come to Saltburn. Mr. Quick. Wow. And here he is now. Oh, what beautiful eyes. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, I told you it wasn't a minger. Oh, but darling, you're kind about everyone. You can't be trusted. I had them hang up an old school dinner jacket. We dressed for dinner here. Dressed for dinner? Yeah, it's like, uh, it was like black tie. I think I like you even more than last year's one. You're so, um... So what? Real. Can't have been easy for Venetia. With you being a mother. Why? Now it's time to take things up a notch. Shawty had them apple bottom jeans. Boots with the fur. This place? You know, it's not for you. Lots of people get lost in salt burn. Oh, that's just giving me goosebumps. Look, Pamela. Oh, no. I think you're a moth. Quiet, harmless. Drawn to shiny things. <laughs> what have you done? I just thought that maybe I could help. You're not leaving us. You're not leaving, so. to talk about so <laughs> I just want to say that eyebrow piercing was just perfection this is 2006 to 2007 the most of the action right yeah I remember I don't know if that's true of America but I remember in the UK everybody at that time had some kind of hideous piercing <laughs> I mean, included. the thing is, oh, I mean, I'm I'm so sad to have retired my butterfly dangling belly button piercing, which I think I did on the cheap. So it's sort of a, sort of at a slant. And uh, was it septic most of the time? Very yeah. much. Very. It was it was 90 percent septic. <laughs> Weeping. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is about the the thing is about the eyebrow piercing was I really fought so I'm so glad that you liked it because I really fought for the eyebrow piercing because the kind of conversation was you know from from the amazing producers was but why would you make Jacob Elordi the most beautiful man in the world why would you sort of mar his face with an eyebrow stud and I was like you guys you have never been a 17 year old girl or boy who's been faced 
with an eyebrow piercing in the wild because that is it's devastating (laughs) we've all we've all made huge mistakes because of eyebrow piercings so um I really hope that it it starts a trend (laughs) (laughs) um so okay I want to go back to the beginning a bit um obviously you know I remember speaking with you at length about promising young women and your process with that and one of the things that I without spoiling anything I think Saltburn and that film have in common is that there are twists we never see coming and there's also not necessarily the happy ending we might expect in some in some ways uh what do you think led you to those kind of themes and what about this particular kind of gothic upper class country mansion got you I I have heard you say that you've been thinking about it for years so how did that happen I've been thinking about Saltburn for such a long time and Ollie the lead character Oliver kind of presented himself to me this sort of happens they're a bit like imaginary friends they sort of appear and I suppose that I'd, I'd spent my teen years so much of my life reading gothic novels and watching these films and you know reading the work of the Brontes and um and you know listening to Kate Bush reading Hilary Mantel and Sarah Waters and um watching Joseph Joseph Losey's films and Merchant Ivory and there was this there's this feeling of that you get in the go-between or Rebecca of you know this this thing that we're very familiar with, this structure, which is that something happened in the past. You know, there was a summer that has meant everything has been frozen in time. It can't be, it can't, it, it, it can't be gotten away from somehow. And I feel like for me, that is what falling in love for the first time feels like. It's something you kind of can't ever escape. And so I think, you know, I I wanted to make a really gothic movie that had that sort of emotional gothic feeling, which is both erotic, but also kind of full of horror, as mm-hmm. that as the genre kind of tends to be. And and I think it, yeah, it just it made sense to me only after the fact that this was the film I finished writing during COVID, because it's a film about what what happens to you when you can't touch the thing you want to touch, the person you want to touch? You know, what happens when you're only allowed to look because we were all of us in this permanent state of watching, of looking, of kind of looking at people's lives and and this sort of slightly erotic and strange thing of, you know, following people whose lives we perhaps would pretend we disapprove of to some degree or we do disapprove of, but we're still gripped by them. We're still sort of erotically tuned in to some degree, even if that feeling is sort of one of, the the root of it is sort of discomfort or disgust or even kind of loathing. So all of those things felt like, you know, and, and I think the film's preoccupation in many ways with sex and with the excretions of the human body, maybe we can say, and sort of, it feels like, you know, we were living in a time when you couldn't even breathe in the same room as someone. So it it makes sense to me that this is, yeah, that this is a film about kind of restraint and how that drives us all mad. Mm. Well, when you talk about, you know, this idea of being fascinated and maybe even disgusted by other people's lives and when we were very isolated, I think a lot of that was via social media because we had no other way to obsess on people um and something really interesting to me about this film is that the era you've chosen means that we're not watching people obsessed with iPhones which I think is a fantastic idea to just take us back to this hallowed era before we were glued to the tiny computer in our hands um and all we've got is these basic blackberries in the film yeah and uh, R.I.P. And <laughs> not only does 2006 and seven allow us this kind of plethora of amazing looks and visuals and style, you know, the bracelets and the clothes and 
again, the eyebrow piercing. <laughs> but we have everybody kind of talking to each other in a way that I think we've sort of lost. So can you tell me about your decision to set it in that era? Totally. Well, I think it was it was firstly led by the structure. I wanted to adhere to the classic structure of, of a narrator taking us back to this time. So it, I knew it always needed to have that framing narrative. And so it needed to be set in the past to some degree. Um, and 15 years, so so the summer of 2007 was exactly 15 years from the summer we filmed the film. And 15 years ago is a really interesting time gap because it's always lame. Mm -hmm. It's not cool yet. It's not come back into fashion. I mean, increasingly we've, we'll find that it is, but you know, it's it's it really humanizes everyone to see them with the bad extensions, the cringe tattoos, you know, the dodgy makeup, the the sort of um, you know, the the bad fake tan, the double popped, you know, the, the polo shirt on top of polo shirt, double popped collar. That stuff is very humanizing. And what it does is if you're setting a film that, you know, that you hope to make that is timeless in a genre that is up to a point timeless, fixing these people in places like Oxford and Saltburn that are completely unchanging, giving them dis distinct human, humanizing qualities was very, very helpful. We all, all make ourselves all the time now online. Like, we're all of us presenting something that is miles away from perhaps the thing that we maybe feel privately about ourselves. It's all a projection and yeah, but I want to also be careful to say that that when I look at people's things online, when I look at people, it is not with disgust at all. It's it's with unbridled joy. I'm I'm constantly impressed by people who, yeah, who do kind of live that way and, and and are able to live online in the way that they are. But I think it's it's an observation that I felt that that there's a kind of pseudo disapproval. There are the people who follow very very beautiful women or um, people with very beautiful clothes or very beautiful houses. And there's a sort of like, there's a sort of, oh God, you know, but I don't, you know, but I don't approve, whatever it is. But actually that whole, that tension is so interesting itself because it's sort of, it's sort of not true because people, you know, part of it is that feeling of that weird feeling that you can have of kind of superiority. I don't know, it's it's, it's very complicated, and but I think it's it's all part of, you know, the same thing with the Catons is that we should know better. They will never love us back. These places can never be ours, but we all hope maybe it will be different for us. Like Ollie, you know, we might get to stay forever. It might not just be the summer. And we, the audience, need to feel that as powerfully as Ollie does, even though we know it's not true. We like mm -hmm. know totally it's not true, but, you know, we just hope. You know, I love the way that you you get into the kind of way that British upper class people have a lot of these kind of barbs and hidden rules because everything is unsaid. Nothing is ever deliberately spelled out. And the closest you get to kind of spelling out how you are supposed to fit in is when, well, we saw some of it in the trailer where um, Felix says to Ollie, oh, we dress for dinner. And he does this perfect little kind of awkward, embarrassed thing where he's like, it's, it's black tie, you know? And, and then we also, uh, that's not in the trailer, we see him say, oh, you know, my mother has an, a, an allergy to facial hair. So I've left a razor for you to shave. And I think that's so dead on. It's like, there are all these rules for behavior. And if, and if you trip up, you're out and you will you will never be included and it's kind of like this weird subversive game and I love that you use this as the vehicle for Oliver to try and win if you like yeah um, well and it's and it is a labyrinth and every what I what I learned in making this film too was that every house every family like this has their own very specific rules too so from one house to the next you may find that the way that you're you know, eating your soup is wrong. You know, it's all designed as a kind of weird, strange, unwinnable test. And so the labyrinth was always a very important thing for us. You know, the maze in this film, 
we had the maze designed by this incredible maze designer called Adrian Fisher that I became obsessed with after reading an article about him in New Yorker. And we asked him to make the maze, the Saltburn maze, even if you know it didn't really exist. I wanted it to kind of physically be real in some to some degree. And there are two ways of getting to the center. And we asked that Adrian, the, the, the main way had to be the hardest way you could get to the center of any maze he'd ever designed. But the other way is cheating and you go yeah. straight in. It's such a literal, perfect explanation for everything that's happening. <laughs> and that is what this is, you know, there are, there are ways you cannot beat them at their own game. Mm -hmm. It's impossible, but you can make up your own rules. And that's where things kind of get interesting, I think. And, and you know, again, it's so much of this is about, and so much of why it's set, honestly, in a country house like this is because we have so effectively exported the British arist aristocracy, you know, in movies and in TV. We So we all of us as audiences kind of know, we know enough that we understand when somebody's made a mistake or, you know, the glances between Duncan and Sir James, you know, mean that somebody's made an egregious so it's but, like you know, Downton like, Abbey gone wild. Totally. <laughs> and it, but, it, but those things are important because the thing is, again, it's the same thing. It's like, who cares how you order your breakfast? It doesn't matter. We all know this. We know this. It doesn't matter. But yet we feel that intense mortification for Oliver and for ourselves because we all know what it feels like to say or do the wrong thing. And that could be anywhere. So early on, Margot Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap, came on board. Tell me about the conversation you had with them, because I also know that you tend not to show people until you're done. So it's it's kind of a private process for you writing your films. So what did you and Margot talk about and how did you explain it? Well... Um, so obviously I'd worked with them on Promising Young Woman, so I loved them. So there was sort of no question that I'd work with them again. Margot is just, I mean, except she's just a genius. She really is a genius. Um, she's so exceptional. And then Josie, who's my kind of onset producer, who's one of the partners at Lucky Chap, you know, he's just the best. So I sent the script to Lucky Chap because I think that's the thing about partnerships too, is that everything that you make, you want everyone to really, really kind of effusively want to do it. And I always want, I never want anyone to feel like they have to, because of a previous arrangement or whatever, they have to be involved or whatever. So it's it's a really nice process every time to kind of ask people to dance, you know, mm -hmm. at the school disco and, you know, they have the absolute option to say like, absolutely not, <laughs> not this time, <laughs> friend. Um, so they read the script and they luckily did want to come on board. And I think that they, Margot's such a cinephile, like she she has seen every film that has ever been made. And so she, I think, was really, really attracted to the idea of making a sort of classic, you know, or, or attempting to make a really classic movie, a, a, a sort of, um, you know, in, in many ways, ones that's kind of a, an old fashioned film in that it's, it is a Gothic film and it is a sort of, hopefully a kind of timeless thing and and that's what she was really excited by and they like making things that they feel at least are singular to some degree mm. um that that may not be easily digested they like making things that they think will connect to people um so that's I, I mean I'm just I love them so much so I do want to get into more of the production design, the costume design and the performances here but before we do that, Let's just roll a clip. Oh, some awful stuff. Oh, because of a squat. And both his parents were dealing. God, and his mother's a drunk. I mean, babies can be really affected. Traumatized. Oh, they come out drunk. Is that right? He had to put his fingers down his mother's throat oh, to yeah. make her sick. Barley, that's private stuff. Well, you told us. In confidence. His mother's awful, sick. Darling. His mother was sick. His mother was I, sick. I think that's actually yeah, rather normal well. when you're poor. I think when you're poor, that sort of thing does happen a little bit more. I'm giving you this one time. Good luck. He doesn't smile much. Farley seems to think he's ghastly. Why are you friends with him? That poor, not attractive, and his parents are truck addicts. I can't uh -uh. actually understand. And here he is now. We were just talking about Don't you. Don't be silly. 
Marley, you just make up the most awful things. Of course we weren't. Hello, Oliver, darling. Oh, what beautiful eyes. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, I told you it wasn't a minger. Oh, but darling, you're kind about everyone. You can't be trusted. What a room full of talent that is. That's I obviously mean. such a, a key scene where we meet the family for the first time in the library, um, which is your background right now. Um, oh. So, so uh, we've got, you know, Barry Keoghan doing this insanely genius piece of work where we not only have we believe that Felix believes in him but we don't believe in him I'm not sure how Barry did that uh Jacob Elordi being brilliant with a you know his insouciance walking around in his crumpled linen uh, upper class shirt um Rosamund Pike as Elspeth Richard E Grant piece of genius casting uh, I could go on you know there's Alison as Venetia and and Farley is the best character. It's just a wealth. Tell us about casting to start with, and then maybe elaborate on the production design. We can see some portraits behind you, and I know that there's a story there. Yes. Oh, God. Well, it's just, the thing is, is that the luck, the luck of kind of getting to work with these people, like just watching that clip, it's impossible to describe how deeply I love every single person who made I mean, Carrie is pa that hilarious Pamela. There's Carrie. Poor dear Pamela. I mean, <laughs> PDP. She was, well, Carrie, I sent her the script just to read as my friend. And she called me and said, please, can I be poor dear Pamela? And I was like, well, I mean, she's in three scenes. So if you want to, I would be honoured. And, you know, and lo and behold, it's a masterwork as with everything she does. I think, you know, it was, I like to meet people first. I loved Barry. I just think he's so talented. I I loved him in Killing of a Sacred Deer. And and Oliver needed to be this this very, you know, he needed to be somebody that we both loved and mistrusted. There needed to be the kind of thing that this film is whole is is all about, which is there's an attraction and a and a repulsion too. There's a constant kind of ebb and flow, which I think is so much to do with kind of love and the erotic and power. And he's so, you know, he's 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 actually an unbelievably gifted silent actor. You know, he's he's brilliant at dialogue too, but he's physically an extraordinarily powerful actor. And 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 in his stillness, he is unbelievably compelling. And the closer you get, and we like very, you know, I love a very, very close close up, the closer you get, the less you know. Such a rare thing for a film actor. He's so He's so um, enigmatic, and that's really what this this film needed at its center was something who is both everything and nothing, who is who is changeable in in so many ways. Um, and then Jacob just did the best audition in the world. You know, he just came in, and it's such a masterful comic performance. It is such a brilliant bit of observation. He came in, and he just was Felix. And it's a really difficult part that, really difficult because it it's so it would be so easy to make him sort of one dimensional, and he's so beautifully defined and he's so lovable in spite of the fact that you know I wrote Felix to make sure that in every scene he does something cruel or shitty but we don't care because we love him and that's the genius of Jacob's performance as you forget we sweep it under the carpet as much as Oliver does as much as any of us do Rosmond the greatest comic actress of her generation I just begged her to be in it thank god she said yes the same for Richard Archie who plays Farley and Alice and Oliver, who plays Venetia, they auditioned and they both just did the best auditions in the world. And the thing is, is that I think when people really, you just, you know, I think you just know, it's like falling in love, you know, when the right person comes along and then when they all meet each other, the process is so exciting. The rehearsals that I like to do are much more relaxed. I don't want anyone to be off book because I want to be able to, I, I try to minimize the redrafting to keep the script feeling a bit more alive. I think the more you work on paper, the more kind of chewed over it can feel. So I try to leave 
my kind of drafting until after the actors have been cast and we've rehearsed so we can fold any of those things in. The thing with actors like this is that you want to see any two of them in a room together going head to head. There's no configuration in these actors and these characters that isn't compelling, you know? And that's where you know you've got something that everyone's chemistry is very, very different, but very potent. And, you know, they're all such talented actors that there's the power of dynamic too. This whole film is about power and it shifts constantly, you know, scene by scene, line by line. And you need unbelievably talented actors to, to do that, to know when to yield power and to know when to exert it, to know when those moments happen, to use that negative space. And, and then similarly, the space around them is made by, you know, Susie Davis, the most unbelievable, unbelievable production designer. And I like to make movies that are expressive, that are metaphorical, that are, you know, that, that are films, you know, that, that have pathetic fallacy, that have the sort of gothic, the gothic thing that every scene is, is crafted to be, to emotionally, you know, to look and feel like the characters look and feel, I suppose. Um, and Susie and Linus and all of us together and, and Sophie who did the costumes and Sean who did the incredible hair and makeup, all of us are there So you know, what every detail that is on screen needs to tell us something about character, needs to tell us about what this scene is going to do emotionally about what we can expect that's the joy of it and 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 you know we all work really closely together all the time me and Lena share a monitor usually if you have a director and a dp who have different monitors but we share one so that so that everything is as is as complete as it can be on the day for everyone so we're not you know that it's that we're all kind of working together and and our and our crew was 50 nearly 55 percent women which I think was the first, it was the first film of of that scale or above in England to have that. And, you know, just the the kind of, it makes a difference. It makes a difference, I think, to, to everyone. That feeling of just not, it, just that that it's equal, that you feel it's, that, that there's kind of, there is a vibe where everyone is collaborating, everyone is working with each other. And it, yeah, it was just a joy. It was a real joy. So unfortunately, we're running out of time. I could talk about Saltburn forever. There's so much to this film. But could you give us one thing that in case someone hasn't had the chance to see this film, what's one thing that stands out to you that might make someone feel compelled to sit down and see it? An 80-year-old woman stopped me after a screening of this in Texas. And she grabbed me by the arms and she said, I've never been so turned on in my life. That may be the best answer ever. <laughs> so go see it. So you see it. And, may, and, you know, you may feel differently. Lots of people do. But, you know, I want, I, I want, pe I just, if people feel anything, it's, that's wonderful. That's exciting. Well, thank you to our friends at Amazon MGM Studios and to Emerald for joining us today. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us for Heart Hour. Win.